yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rappers fed. In the future, but also too, uh, always blame it on me. As long as it's not murder one or something illegal, you blame it whatever you want on me. Like Andy said to do this if you want to do something crazy, um, within <laughs> within reason, okay, for, for database stuff. Um, the other thing I'll say is too, I'll send out an email. We'll, we'll do what we did last semester. For everybody in the class, you put your CV in a directory, and then we'll send it out uh, to all the database companies. So you get uh, a bunch of interviews over the summer. So that'll, that'll, that'll fix you, OK? OK. All right, so query optimization, super important, super hard. Let's jump into this. But quickly, for administrative stuff, Project 2, again, the first version is due this, uh, uh, this, this Saturday. Again, on the, on the website, there's a link to a Google form. Just put, it, put in what, you, what you've done in, in the link to it. We'll look at it and give you feedback. I did update the schedule, and this is live on, on the, the website now. The project updates will not be next Monday. It'll be next Wednesday, the 5th. So we'll do Monday will be the, the lecture on cost models. Wednesday, we'll do the presentations from, from the groups. And then the following Monday, we'll then do uh, the, we'll then talk about, start talking about real, you know, the, the real systems. All right, cool. And then and if, you have, if you want to talk, talk about Project 3, please come to my, either my office hours or send me an email. I'm happy to chat, OK? All right. All right, cost, query optimization. So as I said before, this is the hardest part about database systems. And I fully admit this is the part of database systems I know the least about um, because it's so hard. Uh, and so you know, we'll go, we won't go too deep into the, the nitty gritty details. But I just want to give you a, uh, you know, sort of a quick survey of why this problem is hard, what people have, have done, what real systems are doing. Uh, and then we'll see, uh, you know, sort of how to extrapolate from that, like what is potentially one better approach than, than another. Um, and so at a high level, what we're trying to do here is that because, again, SQL is declarative, you, it's, someone's writing a query, line, query that says, this is, the, this is the answer I want. And it's up for the database, systems, uh, it's up for the database system to take that SQL query and convert it into a physical plan that, that can, can execute. And the goal is in the query optimizer is that it's trying to find a correct execution plan that has the lowest cost. So correct is obviously emphasized because it doesn't matter if we have a, the, the fastest query plan in the world, if we produce incorrect results, assuming we're not doing approximate queries execution, if we have incorrect results, then who cares how fast it is, right? Because people are going to complain. And then I'm putting the, the cost part in quotes because that's going to be a, uh, a subjective value that that will depend from one system to the next or based on what are the priorities of, of, of that system, what the operating environment is. Again, depend on, on a bunch of different, different factors. And it's typically not going to be tied to a real work cost, like uh, execution time. We're going to use some kind of stand-in, like the number of tuples uh, that, or the selectivity, the cardinality of the operators, that will be a stand-in that we use to, de to determine whether one plan is better than another. So we can't. You know, and, and this is an eternal metric that'll be used within the database system itself, and not something we can compare against in, in other systems. So we can't take whatever the, the cost estimate from MySQL query plans and, and apply it to Postgres. Some systems like DB2 can spit out, but also like here's the execution, the, the estimate execution time, but most systems do that. Most systems do not do that. All right, and the, so the reason why this is so hard is because uh, it's an NP complete problem. So just fixing out the, fig, figuring out the join order in a, in, within the query is going to be incomplete. But then if you take the whole entire query plan itself, right, that's just even harder. And so even the, the misnomer is going to be that even though we're going to call this query optimization or the query optimizer, no, no database system is going to produce the true optimal plan for a query. Because right? it's just going to take too, way too long to run and try to figure things out. Like It doesn't help us. It would not be good if we have a query shows up and we spend 10 hours trying to figure out the, the optimal query plan, but then the query runs in, in two seconds. Right? So we're going to use a bunch of heuristics and estimation techniques to try to, to not only guess what the real cost is going to be, the estimated cost of each query plan, but then we're going to use a bunch of heuristics to cut down and throw away things in our search base that we know we're not even going to want to even consider to make the problem more tractable. All right? So, yes? So if you have a really small uh, query, then you could solve it right? Small query in terms of what? He said select one. Yeah, sure. 
we'll see this in a second. There'll be, there'll be a notion of startable queries where I know no joins. I have an index that, does, that exactly matches what's in my where clause. It's that, yeah, that'll be helping more. Absolutely, yes. Or select one. Actually, that even go, doesn't even go past the, yeah. some systems don't even go past the, <laughs> the, 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 the optimizer for that, right? So his question is, if, if, the, if, this, if the query is simple enough, we, we will be able to do an exhaustive search. Yes. Um, but it's, you know, it's, uh, and oftentimes I would say too, it's, 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 a, it's not just, oh, is the search algorithm efficient enough? The cost model estimates are gonna be a big problem as well, and that we'll cover next week. And the challenge is gonna be that the errors that, that you make about you know, what do you think the selectivity in the lower portion of the tree, those things just get uh, magnified as you go up because it's now errors on top of errors on top of errors. So once you get beyond like five tables in your joins, it's, it's a shit show. It's, it's, a, it's a complete mess. And again, we'll see a paper next week uh, from the Hyper guys on developing this thing called the join order benchmark based on the IMDB data set where they do a bunch of joins and you see how bad they all get as, as, you, as the number of joins go up. But the, the point I was gonna make also too about, we're not finding the optimal plan, even though we're gonna call this the optimizer. Back in the old days in the 1970s, they called this, the, the, this part of the system we're talking about here, the compiler. I think Snowflake in the documentation even refers to it as the compiler. And that's because again, think of like in the 1970s when, when they developed SQL, you know, they were coming in the world of like, oh, C, that's a high level language. Uh, that's better than assembly. We'll have a compiler generate machine code for us. Same idea. SQL is a high level language. We'll have a compiler that generates the physical plan to execute the query. So some people say query planner, some people say query optimizer. That's what I say. There's also some systems that call it the query compiler. They, they're, we're all talking about the same thing. All right, for the next two weeks, uh, this week and next, we're gonna talk about sort of different ways to implement optimizers. We'll talk about some, some methods next class on how to do uh, sort of static based rewriting. And then we'll spend time on how we actually do enumerations and essentially to, to traverse the solution space to try to find the right, the, the, the best physical plan. Um, and this probably, we'll spend most of our time talking about this. And then uh, we'll also finish up next class on going over like, here's a bunch of the newer systems like CalCite, MemSQL, uh, SQL Server, and how they do certain things. And then uh, on Monday next week, we'll do, we'll do cost models, okay? All right, so today we'll kind of, kind of background what query optimization means at a high level. Uh, that's what the basics of, basic of implementing an optimizer and sort of key decisions we have to make in, as part of this process. And then we'll go through sort of a chrono chronological history of query optimizer implementations going back to the 1970s. And it, it seems bizarre, like this, this is 2023, why am I spending time talking about how they did it in the 1970s? Well, because that's pretty much how people still do some things today, right? Uh, like the way, the way IBM invented to do cost-based uh, query optimization back in the 1970s on system R is more or less what Postgres does today. Yes? Someone UC, I Googled it because I was curious, but somebody's UC Berkeley PhD thesis is using like machine learning for query optimizing. So well, well, her statement is someone at Berkeley is doing, uh, at Sanjay Krishna, I'm assuming it, he's now at Chicago. I see. Yeah, her statement is, uh, there's somebody at Berkeley had a PhD thesis on using machine learning for do query optimization. Yes, there's, there's been several approaches on this. We'll talk a little about this next class. Um, but to get there, we gotta talk about this stuff first, okay? All right. Um, and then the, the, so the paper you guys read today, that was, I mean, it's an old paper, something like 1998 or something like that, uh, from uh, Sergeant Chaudhry, who's like one of the top people at Microsoft Research in the database group. Uh, and it's an old paper, but again, it's a good survey of what, how these things actually work. And even though you bring in machine learning, it's still at the end of the day, the, the way we're doing transformations, the way we're doing rewriting, the way we're doing figuring out join ordering, it's the same problem, just whether, we, whether or not we can use ML to solve it. So here's a, here's a broad overview of what the system would actually, uh, data system would look like doing, leading up to the query optimizer. All right, SQL query shows up. There's an optional, st optional step where you can do rewriting at the SQL level like literally like looking for string matches and rewriting stuff. Then your SQL query, this is rare. You only see this in, 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 in some middleware systems. Then the SQL query shows up. You're gonna parse it, generate an abstract syntax tree. And now you just have a bunch of tokens in the SQL strings from, from the strings. You run it through the binder. The binder is gonna map table names to object IDs, column names to object IDs and so forth. 
Uh, and this can get quite tricky when you start doing uh, a bu bunch of nesting on the lateral joints, of, as we talked about. Then there'll be a uh, rewriter step where you, uh, the, tr the, the annotated tree comes in, a logical plan, and then you can do a bunch of transformations based on rules to figure out how to, how to rewrite stuff. Again, this is what we'll see in the heuristic-based approach as we go along. Then you have your cost-based query optimizer, and this will use a, a cost model to estimate the, the execution cost of one query plan compared against another. Uh, and then it, at the end of the day, it'll, it'll spit out a physical plan. And the physical plan is what we can actually run, right? The like physical plan would be like a logical plan would be I want to do a join on A and B. The physical plan would be I want to do a hash join on A and B. And then whether or not we're doing just non, just non compilation or transpilation, we can take this physical plan and then generate uh, machine code for it. All right. So the, the next slide is basically what I just said. Right. So there's this there's this difference between logical plan and physical plan. Uh, the the idea here is that the logical plan is going to represent the, out, the relational algebra expressions that are, that are represented by the SQL statement. And then ideally, we'll then produce a physical plan that converts the logical operators into physical operators uh, that we can then use to actually execute in, in, our, in our engine. Right? Again, these physical operators specify exactly what algorithm we're going to use, with what, uh, what parameters, on what access path, and so forth. So it's not always going to be the case, that, but most of the times it'll be a one-to-one -one mapping between a logical operator and a physical operator. Like if I want to do a nested loop join uh, on table A and B, there'll be a scan, uh, there'll be logical operators to do the scans, and a logical operator to do the join, and then I convert that to a physical form, I'll have a sequential scan for A, index scan for B, and then a nested loop join for, for, for the, you know, joining them two together. In some cases, though, it, you, can, you can merge. Like if I do a logical join and a logical order by, I can convert that into a single physical sort merge join operator. And in other cases, uh, they can explode. But for simplicity, for today's class, we'll always go one to one. Right? And then for relational algebra equ equivalencies, this is stuff we covered in the, uh, in the undergraduate level, um, an undergraduate course. But again, the basic idea is like we can rely on the commutativity and transitivity properties of relational algebra to reorder things in our physical plan, and then we know we're producing the s still the same result. Like if I join A, B, and C, where B, C gets joined followed by A, that's equivalent to a join on A and C first followed by B. And we can exploit that in figuring out what's the best order for, uh, to do our joins, so producing this, uh, the fastest plan. Or the, the plan with the lowest cost. I, I, I don't want to say fastest, because it, it, it isn't always just about speed. Right? There might be other considerations, like network traffic or memory usage. All right, so now to, to his point here, like how can you find, how can you be guaranteed that you're finding a physical plan, or sorry, the most optimal physical plan? Um, for OTP workloads, this is really easy, because uh, most of the times they're going to be what is called chargeable, right? Some weird term they invented in the 80s, right? It means search argument able, and that just means that we have a uh, direct mapping from a sort of the access methods we're trying to, we need for the table and maybe the join method. It's a direct mapping to a to a like an index that already exists. So if I so I have a table like this on foo, has a primary key, has a has a name column. If my query comes along where it literally is just select name from from foo where id equals one two three, I don't have to do any cost based search. I know immediately in my where clause I'm doing a lookup on id, uh, and I I have a, that's a primary key, so I just know I can just use the index on this. Right. Even if you had things like if there's an include column in your index on ID, where name is included in that, again, same thing. You just you just simple heuristics to decide what's the best index to, to use for this for this query. For the in our world, in the OLAP stuff that we're talking about for in this class this semester, it, this is not always going to happen. Almost never is going to happen because we're going to have once you start doing joins, you have to take a cost into consideration. And so we've been using the term cost model or cost estimates. Again, this will be the backbone for how we're going to decide whether one query plan is better than another, either at a logical level or a physical level. We can ignore that for now. But the basic idea is that there's going to be some statistical uh, data we've collected or extracted from our data set, from our databases. And we can build histograms, we can build sketches, additional metadata about uh, the min and max value, like the zone map stuff, or you know, what the distribution of values are. And we're going to use this to decide whether what's the, ex the expected execution cost of either you know, a single physical operator 
or the collection of them in, in a query plan. And so the, the, every database system is going to have their own way that they, they do these estimates. This is where things go really wrong, as I said. This is actually where I think machine learning is, is a better approach than maybe some handwritten statistics. Um, but again, we'll, we'll cover all this next week. Just know that again, as we're talking about these different uh, optimization strategies, when we get to the cost-based ones, this is what they're relying on. And you can see this in Postgres now. You can, you can, you know, if you log into Postgres, this PG, there's a table called PG Statistics. And you can see for every table, they maintain a little histogram of, of the values. And every time the garbage collector runs, they try to update it. And this is what they're using as the backbone for deciding the selectivity of operators. All right, so I want to go through five different uh, design decisions we have in our query optimized implementation. Um, and I'm sort of go through a quick smattering. Well, here's all the things you have to consider if you're building an optimizer from scratch. Um, and then we'll jump into, the, again, the history of different, uh, st different strategy implementations. So we'll, we'll go each of these one by one. So the first thing we're going to deal with is what is our optimizer going to examine? What's the scope of its optimization uh, search? And the two choices are just, am I operating on a single query at a time or multiple queries at a time? Most systems work this way with the top one, right? You open up the terminal, you run one query in, you, you submit one query, the, the, query, the database system gets that, parses it, runs it to the optimizer, spits out a, a single plan, right? Like 99% of the queries in the world, like 99.9% .9 of the queries in the world are gonna work this way, right? Because you don't know what are the other queries you maybe combine at the same time, because you're only, the system's only looking at that one connection for that one query showing up. Typically also too, it's not gonna account for other queries that could be running at the same time, even if they're coming in a different connection, right? There's some tricks you can do, like scan sharing, as we talked about the intro class, where you know there's some cursor ripping through a table that you need to read that same table and you can piggyback off theirs. But by then, this is actually during the execution time that makes this, this decision not in the query optimizer. By, by the time you get that point, the query, op, query optimizer is done. Some systems can be very sophisticated in their cost models and account for other queries running at the same time during query optimization. I think DB2 can work, work like this. But at the end of the day, they're still only doing optimization for your single query. The alternative is that if you have multiple queries at the same time, or showing at the same time, and you know that we executed with, within, uh, roughly within the same time window, that you could try to optimize them together, do like a global optimization. Because what might be the best plan for each, phys for each single query globally might be the worst choice because they all contend with each other. Um, and if you can do this, you can actually start you know, scaring, uh, being more aggressive in, in sharing results. So again, I don't think there's, there might be, uh, DB2 might do this, but I don't think anybody else does. Um, this shows up in uh, sometimes in the, the stream processing systems or like or continuous query systems where you, you you define some query you want to run all the time, and then you can try the optimizer can look at those and say okay how do I how do I, how do they compose how do they fit them together? Uh, we last year we or two years ago we had the guys from DB, DBT come give a talk. This is super common in the real world now. This is what data scientists use instead of like for pipelines. It's basically Jenga templates. Uh, for, for SQL queries to define like, how, how you do uh, transformations in, in your, your data warehouse. And I asked them, because you have all the queries ahead of time, do you do any additional optimizations globally? And they don't. But that would actually be a right where you could do this, because you know the system wouldn't know all the queries ahead of time, know how they're going to be executed in a certain order, and then optimize them together. But again, nobody does this. The, yes? DBT or, or like in, just in general for this? Yeah, for, for like the multiple queries. Do they do it for like different uh, types? Nobody does it. Oh. Only academic systems, yes. Really? No, like I feel like from what I like heard at Redshift, they like understand that their like customers are like enterprise companies running like similar workloads. So they at least like kind of have like. They're aware of it, but they don't do anything with it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but DBT would even be within the same like. The same company, you know all the queries you're going to have execute ahead of time, right? And they, nobody does any, any global optimization. It's hard, right? Um, again, you can only do it, this would only work if, again, if, if, you're, if you're given, hey, here's the batch of queries I'm going to execute at this time or this interval or in this pipeline. This is like, again, I open up the terminal and I send one thing. And that's why everyone writes it like this. All right. Uh, so next question is, okay, what are we, what, how, how 
how, the op how is the system actually deciding how to optimize the query? And so the top one is, is static optimization, which pretty much everyone does, where query shows up, parse it, plan it, run it through the optimizer, you, you have generative, a generative query plan, and then it's, the optimizer is done. And you run the query, and no matter what happens as you run the query, you, you stick with that plan. Right? Some systems can do dynamic optimization where they generate most of the query, uh, but maybe not all of it. Um, and then they start running it, and then there would be decision points they can decide uh, whether to, to enable certain optimizations or others. So Snowflake can do this. They can decide uh, whether to push down uh, group by aggregation for your query plan uh, at runtime. So you run the query, and it says, OK, if some threshold is met, then I will, I will do group by aggregation early. Otherwise, I'll, I'll do it up above where, where it normally would be. And they make this decision based on how much data is coming out of it. So this is more common. Uh, this is more common in the cloud systems or the data lake systems, where you maybe don't have good statistics or any statistics at all on the data that's sitting in your Parquet files in S3. Uh, Databricks can do something similar like this too, as well. Adaptive query optimization optimization looks a lot like this, where the idea is you use your static optimizer as before, generate the query plan, but you can either generate some, some parts of the query plan, like multiple, multiple versions of it, uh, and then decide as you're running if, if one query plan, if, if the current query plan you're choosing turns out to be inefficient, you maybe can switch as you're running to another port, you know, another sort of query plan tree. Um, that is rare, that's hard to do. The most common one is there's just some basic threshold that says, if, I, if my estimations are way off, kill this whole query, throw away any, any results I've already calculated, go back to the optimizer and tell it, hey, you were wrong, here's why, and try to generate a new plan. Um, the, the more sophisticated approach is only in academia try to keep some of the work you've already computed uh, and reuse that when you come back. But again, as far as I know, no system can do this. All right, so the next issue we got to deal with is, is prepared statements. Uh, I think I teach prepared statements in the intro class, right? Everyone should know what a prepared statement is. All right, all right. I'll, I'll go through it quickly. All right, so say this is the query we're going to execute all the time, right? And we have, we have some constants in it. And so instead of every single time I, I, the, you know, me sending this query, i got to parse it, plan, and optimize it, I can declare it as a prepared statement. In this case, I'm calling it my query. And then now if I, if I want to execute the query, I just use the execute command in, in Postgres or in SQL standard, um, and that'll, that'll, that'll just run this query, right? And I'll reuse the cache query plan that I generated when I, when I, first, uh, I first prepared it. Postgres doesn't work that way exactly. They'll, they'll do lazy binding on, or for the, the query optimizer. But it, think of it working the same way. I have a cache query plan, and I, I don't have to parse it every single, or optimize it every single time. I'll cache it once and reuse it. But of course, in this example here, all the values are hard-coded, right? And so to make this more useful for other, you know, other parts of the application that want to do the same query but on different, different data, I can put in these uh, question marks that are basically placeholders for variables. Sometimes it's dollar sign one. I, I think Postgres is dollar sign one. It could be a question mark in JDBC, but they, they all work the same way. All right, so now the challenge is going to be what should be the join order for the optimizer to generate for this, for this query, for A, B, and C. Right? And so my plan here, I join A, B first, followed by C. But then how can I make this choice? And I'm trying to figure out the optimal join order. Because if, if these parameters aren't known when I prepare the statement, they're only known at runtime, then I got to generate the query plan every single time I invoke the prepared statement, which then defeats the whole purpose of having a prepared statement. Right? So for this example here, it seems kind of trivial. But again, like if, the, if it's a real complex query that I've defined as a prepared statement, if the optimizer takes 10 seconds to run for a query that takes one second to, to execute, then that, this is a bad trade-off. I'm not getting any benefit of, of, of prepared statements. So there's four choices for this. The first is you just reuse the last plan that you generated uh, after you've run it so many times. This is what Postgres does. I think if you prepare a statement, you call prepare a statement, for the first five invocations of the prepared statement, Postgres just optimizes it from scratch. Then on, on the last one, it then caches that and reuses that going forward. And I don't know whether, I forget whether there's a threshold to say, OK, well, let me go back and try to optimize it again. Right? The, 
next approach is to be sort of clever, as I was saying just now. Like there could be a threshold to decide when should I go back and and reoptimize it. And ideally, I, I want my optimizer to be aware of the last plan I've had in my cache and use that as the starting point for for in my search because I can use that as as, as an upper bound in, in my search process. I don't think anybody anybody does this because most of the query optimizer code is not reentrant, meaning I can't do like a like a branch bound search stop, pause what I'm doing, and then come back and pick it up where I left off because they, they just don't maintain that history. The next approach is to have multiple query, multiple plans. Um, I think this is what Oracle and SQL Server do. The idea is that if I have those statistics, I have the, those, those histograms of what the value is going to look like for these different parameters, assuming they're exactly columns and not, not a derived value, then I can maybe have different query plans for, for some portions of the buckets so that when my query shows up, or I invoke the prepared statement at runtime and pass in some parameters, I can look at those parameters and decide, okay, here's the query plan that matches to, you know, to the bucket that they, they belong into. And of course, the more the problem with this one is the more parameters you have, the, 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 the number of possible combinations of bucket values could explode and becomes really expensive. And again, so I think, I think SQL Server and Oracle have basic implementations for this. Another easy alternative would just be take the average value of every single parameter, and then choose use that as the use that as the input for when you when you evoke the optimizer, say generate a query plan for this prepared statement. I think prepared statements are super interesting. Everybody does something different, and I think this is actually this is a research paper here. If, if we can come investigate this, but we we can take that offline. All right, the next thing we got to deal with is plan stability. So, in the database world, faster databases is is, is, is nice. People want that. Everybody says they want that. But oftentimes, what, what is even more important than, than just raw performance numbers is stability in your performance numbers. So it doesn't help us if we do all the things we talked about this semester, make my, query, make my, you know, my execution run really fast for 99% of the queries. But then there's some 1% of the queries where some days are super fast, the next day they're super slow, and then they switch back and they're fast again. That will drive people crazy. Nobody wants that. So in many cases, like, you know, when you see these database companies, here's my, you know, here's my TPCH number, TPCDS numbers, look how fast it is. The metric oftentimes that people really care about is how stable are those numbers for, for my regular workload. People don't want huge oscillations because then, it, then it's hard to figure out like, okay, is my application slow because I did something in my application or is the data something doing something weird? And how do you debug that? So how do you maintain plan stability? Well, it's going to be usually, can, can I, is there a way to, to prevent the, Query optimizer from choosing a different query plan from one day to the next. I basically want to generate the physical plan and then Mimus freeze it for that query, whether to, whether or not it's a prepared statement or not. It, it doesn't, you know, it, both cases I care about. I want to then freeze that query plan and be able to reuse it. So the first way to do this is through hints. So this is where now in the SQL statement itself, the developer or the DBA can, can tell the optimizer, here's what I want my query plan to actually look like. Whatever you're doing, ignore it. Do what I want. So Postgres famously does not support hints. Like this is actually a design choice in Postgres that they said we don't want to do any hints. Every other major database system supports hints. Postgres does not, but you can get hints with a, an extension called PG Hint, uh, where you you put a little SQL comment up here, and you can tell it I want to do a nest loop join for T1 and T2. I want to do a merge join for T1 T2 T3. And this leading uh, parameter here just means this is the join order I want you to consider. So join T1 followed by T2, and then, then followed by T3. Right? And you put this, again, as a comment you pass in as the execution string for the, the SQL statement to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the database system. But again, you have to have the, the PG hint uh, extension enabled. Oracle has their own thing. Right? Again, same thing. Here's the, here's the order. Use nest loop join, use index. Right? In this case here, you have to put it after the select, whereas in PG hint, you put it before, right? All the various major data systems have their own versions of these things. The next choice is to fix the optimizer version. Uh, and this is where you, you have, you vetted all the query plans that your database system has generated for those queries in your application. But then you go ahead and upgrade it to a new version of the database system, right? From Postgres 13 to 14, Postgres 19, or sorry, Oracle 19 to Oracle 22, whatever, right? And it may be the case, though, that the, when the, the new version of the system, after you upgrade, starts generating bad query plans for some of your queries, but maybe only 1% of them. So what you can do is, in some systems, you can specify 
that you want a you want the data system to, to use an older version of the query optimizer to generate the query plans for each for the particular query because you know you'll get back the plan that was fast from before. So Oracle does this. Oracle in every version of Oracle they ship in the binary is every ver previous version of the optimizer they, they've ever created within like the last decade or so. So you can install the latest version of, of Oracle 22, but you can tell it, I want Oracle 12 optimizer for these queries. What are you shaking your head? Funny. <laughs> but he's shaking his head as, as if it's terrible. So he said, so David, you need to maintain multiple versions of the optimizer. Yes. But again, he owns a Hawaiian island. He's making a lot of money. People pay, like, people pay a lot of money for the this, this stability for this feature, right? Uh, we, people whose jobs are to maintain optimizer from 2008. Yeah, I don't want to do it, but, like, but like, it, it matters, right? I personally don't want to do it. I'm glad, but I'm. They're uh, not compromised. That's not the word. <laughs> What's the word for, like, compensated correctly? Let's, okay, let's, let's be recorded. <laughs> Um, okay, so I would say so the, the problem is like again, as if you if you stick old query plans or queries to the old old optimizer, you know, as they put out new features in the system, they won't be able to take advantage of it. So we did have a uh, we did a deployment at AutoTune uh, when it was the university project for the, the, the French bank, and they were running I think Oracle 18, and they had it set to Oracle 11 optimizer for some queries, and, and AutoTune figured out oh this is wrong, switch it, and then things got faster. So the, the, but again, like this, this is something you mainly have to do. The system will do this for you automatically. The last one is to basically override the entire query plan itself, where to say before do do my upgrade. Sorry, yes. I was going to say like because the uh, developers have maintained multiple versions of the optimizer, is there a big reason why they wouldn't want to make big changes to the optimizer? Right? His statement is because in case of Oracle, they're maintaining different versions of the optimizer that they would not want to make major changes to the optimizer? Yeah. Uh, like, I mean, again, from, like, going from like, version 11 to version 18, yeah. uh, I mean, they could make big changes, right? Because if anybody wants the old version, they, they stick to, you tell them that it's a version 11. So I suppose you're not making many changes between versions, so it's easier to maintain all the different versions. Right? His statement is that if you're not making major changes, then you could keep things if the code base is similar enough, not a radical rewrite, right. yeah, um, sure. I mean, that's, that's a software engineering decision. Uh, like in the Freud paper, they talk about how they don't want to change the query optimizer. Right, the Freud paper talks about how they don't want to change the query optimizer to, to account for UDS. Yeah, again, the, the the query optimizer is the hardest part of the hardest part of the data system, right? Like, I don't consider myself qualified to work on work on them. Uh, the and so it's really hard to find good people that can, 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 reason, can do this stuff. Um, for better or worse, I've been told that it's, it's uh, for some of the database companies that they like hiring people that do, that do PL uh, research, can be good at query optimizations, and then high energy physics is the other one. So if you don't make it in high energy physics, uh, or uh, you find high energy physics too easy, you can switch to do query optimization. Um, all right. So, uh, I mean, to your point, yes, like, the, like they don't, nobody's doing, ma no major company is doing major, like, complete rewrites of the query optimizer from one major version to the next. That, that would be, you know, suicide. Um, all right, so the last one to begin, you can override the query plan that the, 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 the data system wants to generate with the one you want it to use. Like, so again, if you go from old version of the system to a new version, you dump out the query plan with the old version that you liked, and then you upgrade the new version, and you say, don't do whatever you want to do, here's the query plan that I want. So SQL Server can do this, and it looks like this, right? Here's my SQL query at the top, and they have use plan, and then there's this giant XML thing, which I've cut off because it's long, where you're literally telling this is the representation of the of a query plan in SQL Server in XML form, and you're telling SQL Server use this, and, and, and it'll, it'll do it for you. All right. So the last thing we got to deal with is when do we stop searching, right? So the most obvious one is wall clock time, and this is what most systems do. Again, if, if, I, if you figured out I've, I've finished my search exhaustively, then you're done. But otherwise, if you keep running, I, I could run forever or a really long time. So typically, there's, a, there's a, some knob you can specify, like only run for you know, 100 milliseconds, and at, at which point, terminate the search, and whatever the best query plan you have, just, just use that, even though it may not be optimal. 
Other cases, there's a cost threshold to say if I, uh, if I find a plan that has a lower cost than some value that I can specify, then I go ahead and just stop. Um, and then exhaustion would be what his example, if I, find, if I think I found everything. Another one would be if I haven't found a, a better plan in, in a certain amount of time or certain iterations, then I can go ahead and quit. Again, this is all sort of classic search optimization techniques in, in computer science and not anything specific to database systems. Right? Like, yeah, so, yeah, there's nothing special here. All right, so let's go through now a bunch of different approaches for how to build a search uh, query optimizer. Um, and as I said, this is going, we're gonna be going forward in chronological history, starting with the 1970s and moving forward to actually to the 90s, because that's when they, we sort of figured out, the database community figured out, here's the sort of the stratified versus unified approach. And then this will be a segue into the cascade stuff that we'll read uh, and cover in, in next class, right? And again, the big debate's gonna be, do you wanna use a stratified search going uh, top, top, bottom to the top, or a unified search with cascades going to the top to the bottom? That's sort of the, like the big debate of how you wanna build a, a query optimizer, okay? So we're gonna also going forward, into, going forward in time, uh, forward chronologically in time, we're also going forward in, in complexity. So we're gonna start off with the simplest approach, and then we'll, we'll, we'll finish off with the more complex things. All right, so the, the, the most simplest way to build a query optimizer, and this is what pretty much any new database company that is starting from scratch or will start with, is to use heuristics or rules. And you basically have hard-coded rules and code that look for uh, certain patterns in, in the query plan, in the logical query plan, and we'll define rules that then do that converts them into uh, the physical form, right? So the most, most classic thing would be to, to do predicate pushdown, right? You identify that you have uh, you have some where calls items or some 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 some, uh, some filter operators, and you push them to be you know in line or right above the the sequential scan, right? For uh, for joins, the it's either gonna be something really simple. Like figuring out the joiner, like based on what the order that the, 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 the tables are referenced in the query, or you can do something really simple like, card, like a, a, a greedy search on, on cardinality estimates, right? So this is what this is what the two out of the three of the major relational databases that were built in the 1970s, right? The three would be Ingress, Oracle, and System R. So two out of three, Ingress and Oracle, did this approach in the very beginning. Every new database system that's come along that is like a new startup written from scratch is gonna be doing this. MongoDB, I think, still even does this, uh, as far as I know, right? So I wanna go through what uh, Ingress does, and I'm not gonna say that this is, I'm not saying this is the way to do it. I actually think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a historical curiosity, because I think it's really clever what they did, given the hardware that, the limitations that they had at the time, of how to figure out how to join things, All right? And then it'll motivate why we wanna do the more sophisticated methods. So going forward, I'm gonna use a really simple uh, three table database. Right, we have an artist, an album, and then we have a peers, which is a cross reference between basically all the, the artists that appear on, on a given album. And so the query we're gonna do is, is get all the names of the artists that appear on my mixtape ordered by their artist ID. All right, so we wanna we want do a three way join here. So the thing about Ingress, these, the, the initial version in the 1970s, it couldn't actually do joins. The system could not execute joins. So they had, in their query optimizers, they had to rewrite queries to be able to support things that, that ended up being joins, all right? Because all the queries they could do were only single table selects. All right, so the first step what they gotta do is they're gonna decompose the, the original query into single value queries. So what I mean by that is, say they're gonna take this one query here, say the, say the first part of it, like doing the look of, a, of an album, and we'll have our predicate where we do a lookup on my remix, but then they're gonna write it into a temp table. And then they rewrite the original query to now do, instead of doing a lookup on the, on the album table, they're gonna do a, a lookup on this, this temp table here that they defined in the first query. And then now they'll do the same thing. They'll then decompose this query because it has the join into two separate queries. And the first one is doing a, a lookup on peers, the, so the peers table, but doing a lookup on temp one and then it's gonna write the output of this into temp two, and then this query is gonna do a lookup on the artist table, do a join with temp two, 
uh, that was defined in the first query. So now, again, they don't support joins. So what you have to do is you got to rewrite uh, the queries by substituting the values that are being generated in the, the previous queries in this sort of dependency chain and injecting them into the query plan to do single lookups on, on, a, on a scalar value. So in this, this case here, so we say there's a, you know, the name Andy, Andy's drill remix is, is unique. So when I execute this query, I'm going to produce a single value. So now I can take this value and inject it into this, the, the query on the album table, or the, the peers table, and instead of doing the join against the other table, I put in the, 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 the album ID that I got from the first query. The run, now I run this, I produce two tuples as, that are sorted by the, the artist ID, and then take this query now and do the same thing. Put in the, the values uh, to remove the joins. And I run that, combine these two results, and that's the answer to my query. Right? So I'm showing this at the SQL level. I think the original version of, of in, in Ingress was doing this at the, at the logical level. And what's interesting about this as well is that it's sort of like the dynamic or, or adaptive op optimization stuff we talked about before, because they're, they're running the query optimizer, which is just, just a bunch of if-then-else statements. They're running this on a per-tuple basis. Right? So like here, for every single value here, I generate a separate uh, query. And then for each query, I, I go to the optimizer and get the physical plan for this. So they're running the optimizer for every single query that you, you generate in all of this. Again, so I, I think this is cool. I mean, it's, I you would not want to do this in a, in a real system today. But again, given that what they were dealing with in terms of hardware at the time, and if you read the paper, they talk about, oh, like, yeah, it wouldn't be great if we can do a scan on a table with 300 tuples, right? Which is nothing uh, in, in a modern system. So these heuristic-based approaches, they are, they're nice because they're easy to implement. And as I said, this is what, this is what BusTub does now. Uh, <laughs> it's what most systems start with because, again, it's, it's, you can apply the knowledge that we have, as humans know about databases. We can apply it to you know, codify the rules to do these transformations. Right? There's a sort of straight mapping between the logical operators into the physical operators. The, and for, for simple queries, like the searchable queries, this, this works great. It's fine. The problem is going to be is that you'll find that there's going to be magic constants all in the source code to deal with uh, the decisions that it wants to make. Predicate pushdown is an obvious one. Always push that down. But for like join ordering, if you want to even consider like what order should it be, if you want to take some costs into consideration uh, in your heuristics, there's going to be some magic constant that you have, you have to have. And it's not to say that the cost-based search we'll talk about later, they're certainly going to have magic constants. Postgres has a ton of them. Every system has a ton of them. Uh, but at least, you know, this one is like it's very explicit in the code that you're going to have these magic constants. The other challenge is going to be you're not always, it's going to be very hard to find the optimal plan for more complex queries because there could be dependencies between one transformation to the next. And you would have to then write in your code if this transformation is applied, then I can try this other transformation, apply this other optimization. Otherwise, I can't. And so the code becomes this sort of uh, big tangled jungle. Uh, and this is actually what Postgres looks like, too. Right? Postgres has this problem where it has one of these if and else's where they, they apply these transformation rules. They do a bunch before they do the join based search or the cost based search, and then they do a bunch afterwards. And in the code, you have to, be very, you have to make sure you apply the rules in the right order because you, otherwise, you could end up with a, a funky state. So again, if you're building a new system today, this is what everyone's going to start with. Uh, this is what Oracle did for the longest time. Uh, Oracle started in the 1970s. They didn't get rid of this until like the 1990s. Right? And they got huge. They made a ton of money. They basically dominated the database market by this time without, without having any of the extra stuff beyond what I've talked about here. And they didn't do it the ingress way that I just showed, but they, they, it's basically the, the idea is the same with these if-then-else rules. Um, and so if you go read the, again, the, the the unauthorized or authorized biography of, of Larry Ellison, right? there's this, this page here where Stonebreaker starts talking about Ingress's query optimizer from the 1980s, which does cost-based search. Like they improve what I just showed, um, and what Oracle had. And he, <laughs> Stonebreaker's complaining that their optimizer was total shit, but Oracle's marketing people said, no, 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 we don't have a heuristic-based optimizer. We have a semantic optimizer, and that's, and that's somehow <laughs> better than the system R approach. right? And, all, and again, what all they were really doing is literally like 
the join order we define in the order that the, the table is going to appear in the, like the from clause. That was it. <laughs> right? And then in the 1990s, they, they re rewrote everything. Uh, I've talked to people that actually worked on the Oracle uh, Query Optimizer, and they, it, it, at least in the 90s, and they said it was like, it was, it was a lot, a lot of code, a lot of C code that was a total nightmare. Because there's all these if and else for these weird corner cases from all the different customers. Okay. So, as I said, Ingress from Berkeley uh, and Oracle, they were doing heuristics at the very beginning. At IBM from System R, they, they invented the cost based search. Again, th so this technique I'm describing here, this is the backbone for how pretty much every system does it today. W uh, some, you, if you use the Stratify search with, with a uh, query optimizer generator, like in Starburst, at the end of the day, it's still basically doing the same thing. It just has a cleaner uh, API for defining the transformation rules. But at a high level, they all work the same. So again, the IBM System R project was where they took Ted Codd's paper, they, they got a bunch of smart people in a room, and they just had brand new PhDs, and said, let's go build this thing. And Pat Selinger was the one of the ones that she took the cost-based cost optimization problem and built the first optimizer uh, for relational databases. So they're going to be doing a bottom-up search. So that means they're going to start with nothing in the query plan, and then you're going to start iteratively or incrementally building into the, the join operators you want to do until you get your end result of what the, the query output should be. And I'll, I'll show in a few slides what, what it, that looks like. So again, System R does this, the early version of DB2 does this, and then most of the open source data systems are going to do something very similar to this. Right, this is what SQLite does, Postgres, MySQL, and everyone. All right, so what they're going to do is they're going to break up the query plan into blocks and then generate all the, the logical operators for each block. Then now they're going to go through uh, and figure out for each logical operator what's the set of physical operators that I can use to implement it. And then use a bunch of heuristics to decide how to throw things that you know you don't want to even consider uh, to reduce the, the prune down the search space. So most famously, they're only going to consider left deep trees and not going to consider right deep trees or bushy trees. Even though it may be that the, the bushy tree is going to be the optimal query plan, because again, in the 1970s, the, the hardware is so limited to, to make the problem more tractable, even today it, it's, it's complex, you, you throw away anything that's not left deep. And you throw away anything that's a, a Cartesian product join instead of an inner join. All right, so if we go back to that same query we had before. All right, so the first step is we're going to choose the best access path for each table. So we just look at, okay, what tables we need to access, what are our where clause looks like, uh, and decide, okay, here's the, you know, here's, here's the best way to do a lookup on these tables. Right? Again, this is just all rules. Right? We, we can decide this. Then we're going to enumerate all possible join earnings for these tables uh, in any possible combination in either as inner joins or, or Cartesian products. But again, they, they'll, they'll immediately throw away Cartesian products. And then this thing goes on forever for all, for all possible join orders. And then now the last step is then do a, a dynamic programming search to figure out what should be, for all these possible choices, what's the best join order to consider for the query plan, and then what's the best physical operator to use for each logical join operator. So, so it looks something like this. So again, we're doing bottoms up search. So we're going to start from this, where we have done, we've done zero joins, and then the thing at the top is our goal. This is what we want to get to. So in the first step here, we say, well, here's the, here's the different types of joins we can do for, 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 every, you know, every, for all the different tables, either doing a hash join or a sort merge join. And then we have these logical operators represented. Here's the, out, the output of this physical operator that we just produced. So we do this for, for, the, for, for the first stage here. And then, we're gonna, and then for each of all these, we're going to use our cost model to estimate what the cost is for executing these physical operators. So then now for every sort of path from one logical operator to the next logical operator in the next stage, we're going to choose the, the physical operator that has the lowest cost. So you'll throw away all the ones that have the lowest cost at this point here. Then you do the same thing for the next stage going up, right? generate all possible physical, physical uh, uh, join operators, choose the one with the lowest cost, and then now you're going to go back uh, backtrack through, uh, fronting from, from the top going down, and then choose the path that has the overall lowest cost uh, amongst all their paths. Right? So the, again, it's a divide and conquer approach. Instead of doing in the, the sort of exhaustive search for all possible different combinations, we only look at sort of, sort of collection of, of, of paths going up. So one key problem about the system R approach is that the 
there's no notion in this in their in their sort of representation of the query plan. There's no notion of the physical properties of the data. So our query had an order by clause on the artist ID, but there's no there's nothing in this in this in this query plan tree that is aware of that, right? There's no it's just joins. There's no order by operator here, right? Uh, it knows nothing about is this hash join going to generate sort of data or not. So then you, after you, you generate this join order, you then had to do extra stuff to figure out, okay, I need to tack on an order by clause here to put, put my data in a, in a sorted order. Or another hack would be I can embed in my, in my cost model the, 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 the consideration of whether the data needs to be sorted or not, and is this operator producing sorted data. And therefore, if I need the data to be sorted and if this operator does not make it sorted, then I set the cost to like infinity, right? So, so I make sure I, I don't choose it. All right, but that's a hack, right? Because not all physical operators, uh, you, know, is, you know, like is it compressed? Is it, is it sorted? It may be the case that I could sort it later on, but if I'm just looking only at the join ordering, I can't, I can't do that. So we'll see now when, when we get to Volcano and the next class will be called Cascades. If we do a top-down approach and we include these enforcer rules or these properties in these physical nodes as we do these transformations, we can be aware that data needs to be sorted, it needs to be of a certain type or have a certain property. And then now we can discard things as we go along uh, where we, that, that don't guarantee those properties. Postgres does this as an afterthought, right? You, you can either bet in the cost model or you can do like additional checks. The top-down approach can, can look at these things holistically. And it, well, that'll make more sense as we go along. And what if there is an aggregation Like, if there is like three table join and aggregation join another table, we'll, we'll optimize, the, optimize the, the four joins together, or first optimize the three joins, and then optimize like the other joins separate. But there's an aggregation between them. Yeah, so his question is what if there's an aggregation in the query plan? Uh, how would it handle that? So, in, that, in the HISMR approach, they would treat that as separate blocks. And you would, you, would, you would optimize the first one and then optimize the second one, and then it's just, just in them together. So you cannot find the optimal plan? In that case, yeah, you it cannot find the, like, the, for this case, example here, you cannot find the global optimal plan for if you have a, like a pipeline breaker like that. Yes? My understanding was the system off style does keep track of interest in orders. But that's it. So the statement is the, the, the system R style does keep track of interesting orders, but that's like a hint to say, consider these things first. Right? I don't. I don't think it's like a. Like it's guiding the search, not setting what the search can do or not do. Mm-hmm. That was my understanding of how it works. Because I guess you would compare against um, one which produces the order you want through the join, versus one which doesn't, and then you have to account for the extra cost of being sort at the end. Yes. But the, 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 I don't think the original search, the, the join enumeration of search s- s- does that. I think it's tacked on at the end. Oh. Am I, so the system, like the, the, I mean, this is, I'm trying to describe the original system R1. Like it was, it got the basic idea right, but then had to tack on a bunch of these other things that were, that, that were limitations to it. That was, that's my understanding of how it works. Yes? Yeah, so his statement is, uh, the bottoms up approach is a greedy based algorithm, and so it's not guaranteed to find the optimal. That is correct, yes. But again, we'll see things when we talk about top down in ca- Volcano Cascades, like you have to do a bunch of you know, similar things to cut things off. Because instead of, like, otherwise, you're just, you know, the search, search is exhaustive. Nobody wants to do that for a complex query. So there's basically similar rules you cut things off to avoid having to search forever. Yes. I just checked the paper, and they basically do what I described. So they keep track of the best plan which doesn't produce an ordering. Okay. And the best plan which does produce an ordering. Okay. And then they consider like, oh, is the extra cost of sorting at the end worth it? And they just compare the two. Got it. Okay. Again, the ordering of the data, not the ordering of the joins. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he says that 
They have they, they would generate the best plan that does it does this guarantees the order by the one that doesn't, and they see whether the after you've done this, figured out the, the best pass through the, the through the query plan, you look to see is it better to tack on the the extra the order by versus having the order by being produced by a certain merge join. Yes, that makes sense. Thank you. All right. Uh, all right, so the, the bottom-up approach we've already talked about, right? You start with nothing and then build up the query plan to get the outcome you want. The top-down approach we'll see in a second with Volcano and then Cascades the next class. This is where you start with the outcome that you have and you, and you traverse down and add things iteratively to the query plan to get you to, the, to that starting point so you have a complete uh, and valid query. Then I'll we'll, we'll cover this more detail in, in a few more slides. So for Postgres, the... the Everything I've described so far, like the system R approach, that's basically what they do if you have a query that has less than 13 tables. I'll talk about what they do when you have 13 or more. But they're going to be doing a heuristics, followed by the join-based search, followed by some more heuristics to put things back in the, in the, in the, and make sure things are in the, in the, sort of set up correctly. As I said, the, the Postgres code is beautiful, like for, at least for C, uh, but the query optimizer is one, one sort of the, I say the, the the, the wart of the code, or like it's, it's the most, I'm going to say it's the least sophisticated, but it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the dodgiest one, maybe, maybe that. Like, because it's, it's just, it's sort of like iteratively worked on, and there's a bunch of you know, rules followed by more rules, followed by uh, this, this, the cost based search, followed by more rules. And then they tacked on this, this genetic algorithm stuff we'll talk about in a second, as almost, almost seems like an afterthought, right? So the, 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 the big challenge of working on this is that the query optimizer for Postgres is that you have to make sure that you do the transformations for these, these, these static heuristics in the right order, otherwise the query plan could end up being incorrect. Um, the very beginning, when we started building our own system at CMU, my, my first or second year, we, we had lunch with the guy, one of the original people working on Postgres in the 1990s, one of the key contributors. He's actually a CMU alum. He lives in Pittsburgh. We asked him about the query optimizer, and he kind of like shook his head and like, yeah, that's, that's the diciest part. Um, <laughs> So again, because this is just hard. Uh, and I'm not, not knocking Postgres. I, I think it's a fantastic system, of course. It's just this one part I think is not as, not as sophisticated as some of the other open source implementations like CockroachDB uh, that, that's out there today. All right, so the pros and cons of this approach. Uh, the, the, the positive is that it usually finds a pretty good query plan for most, for most queries without having to do, within, within reason, without having to do an exhaustive search. The problem is going to be is that it's going to have all the problems we had for a heuristic-based approach, where it's a bunch of handwritten rules. Um, if you make the limitations that System R does, where you only consider left deep trees, you're not going to guarantee to find the optimal query plan. Um, and then at some point, something has to figure out or a reason about is this query plan producing data in the right sort of with the right physical properties, either in the in the cost model or tacked on at the end. All right, another approach that you could take is do a randomized algorithm. Um, and it's basically you do a random walk over the, the all possible solutions you could have for your query plan. Make sure you only consider things that are actually valid or correct, right, that, that produce the right result. And you just keep track of, like, here's the best query plan I've seen before to my, to my search. At some, at some point, you terminate after a timeout. And then you hope that you find something that uh, works reasonably well. Oftentimes, in, in at least for our, for our own research and seen in other papers, random searches do pretty good against, against machine learning stuff. Um, so th this is a reasonable approach. The only system that I know that actually does this in, 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 in practice and in, in production is Postgres. They have, they have a genetic, genetic optimizer, which I'll talk about in a second. So in the sake of time, I'll skip this, but there was a paper in the 1980s, you can do simulated annealing. And the basic idea is you, you do random swaps in your query plan uh, to see whether you stumble upon a, a better, better plan. Um, like you, you flip a coin, decide whether what, what portion of the query plan you want to switch. You switch it, see whether that makes things better or not. If yes, then you keep going with it. Otherwise, you, you throw it away and try again. Right? And of course, you always have to make sure that the query plan is, uh, you know, every step of the way, you have to make sure that it doesn't generate an incorrect query plan. So again, you have to write these hard-coded rules to make sure that the physical properties of the data are guaranteed. So let me talk about Postgres query optimizer, the genetic one. Again, this only gets triggered, uh, this code path only gets triggered if you have 13 or more query, or 13 more tables 
in, in your query plan. There's, a, there's an operator that specifies what that threshold is. By, by default, it's, it's 13. So the way it basically is going to work is generate a bunch of random queries, uh, start doing the random flips, like, like, in, like, like I talked about the last slide, figure out which one is the best, which one's the worst, uh, and then you take the best one and you try to extract traits from it and carry them over to the next generation so that like, there's some aspect of the query plan that's, that's improving because there's some, some, you know, some, some combination of the portion of the query plan turns out to be better than what you've seen before. And you keep going until you, until you time out. So it works like this. So say I'm, I'm joining three tables, R, T, R, S, and T. So at the very beginning, I generate a bunch, bunch of random orderings with using hash joins versus nest loop joins. And then I, I run through my, my cost model, pick, you know, compute the cost for all of these. This one is, is, has the lowest cost. So I keep track of that as the best plan I've ever seen before. Uh, I throw away one that's the worst, and then I use some portions of, the, of the, the, the remaining query plans, use those traits, crossbreed them, and, and permute them together to generate a bunch of new query plans. Do the same thing, generate the cost, find the one that has the lowest cost, that becomes the best I've ever seen, throw away the worst, keep traits from the other ones, and carry those forward. And the idea is hopefully you eventually, again, you, you, you stumble upon one that's better. So uh, the advantage of, of the sort of randomized algorithm is you jump around. It works. Sometimes it can work pretty well, right? And it's easy to do, uh, and it's low overhead to actually to, to maintain the state because if you don't have to maintain the history of all the previous generations, you throw them away and you, and you start over, or for, for, you know, throw them away which, which you've done before, only keeping the best traits uh, going forward. Same thing for simulated annealing. The challenge, of course, is going to be that that figuring out why the database system decided to choose a given query plan is going to be hard because it's a randomized algorithm. Uh, in the case of Postgres, they, they have a, they be, they're very careful to make sure that the, they, they pass in a de deterministic random seed for each query so that if I take the same query and run it through the genetic optimizer, it doesn't generate a different query plan every single time I run because that would break that st stability stuff that we talked about before. So they make sure that if you run the same query over and over again, and it hits the genetic optimizer, it's always going to generate, guaranteed to generate the same query plan. Still have to implement all those correctness rules that we talked about before to make sure that you don't generate query plans that are just you know, way out of whack. So two, two years ago, we had the guy that works, one of the guys that works on the, the Pesto's query optimizer come give a talk at CMU during the pandemic. Uh, and he explicitly says that the genetic optimizer, uh, genetic algorithm optimizer in Postgres doesn't really work that well with the piece of the genetic for the genetic algorithm part, right? The way they carry traits doesn't really work. They, they think it's broken, and it pretty much is a random walk. Um, and that he was, some, it seemed like he was disappointed with, with what that actually is. But again, the code the code's there, and if you have more th more than thirteen tables, you'll, you'll get it. All right. So in all the different implementations we talked about so far. It was humans writing the, the, the actual code to check for these rules check and, and, and then apply the transformations. But writing these, these, sort of these checks and the transformations is difficult to do in a procedural language like C, C++, Java, Rust, whatever, right? Because the way we're trying to operate over sets or over, over you know, relational algebra, and that's hard to do in, in procedural code. So, what we want a, a better approach to do is if we have like a DSL, a higher level language that we, we define in, for our database system, that we can define what our transformation rules are, essentially what the patterns we are that, that we're looking for, uh, and then the transformations that we want to do, and then have someone then, something then take our DSL and then compile that into our procedure code machine, or uh, like our C code or whatever, and we use that to do our, our, our rule check and transformations. And that would be a better approach, because now it's easier to maintain with this high-level DSL. It's easier for us as humans to reason about what the transformations are, what these patterns are checking for, rather than having to look, you know, read if-then-else statements over and over again. So people realized that writing optimizers was hard in the late '80s, and writing and writing all this procedure code to do these transformations was a, was a big pain. And so there was this movement to build what are called optimizer generators where you would, again, define at a high-level language what these, these patterns are, what these rules are, 
run it through this, this, this specialized compiler, and then it spits out the, the, the optimizer code for you that you can run. Right? So the, one of the first ones was IBM Starburst. Again, this was, this was a, Starburst was a system that was a follow-up, like a distributed version of, of DB2. Uh, and then Starburst eventually, the, the, my understanding, the, the, the core framework for the query optimizer did make it into regular DB2. Exodus was the precursor to Volcano, which was the precursor to Cascades. It's all the same German guy that wrote all this stuff. Um, and again, the high level idea is that it's, a, it's an optimizer generator. You know, we say we used the Volcano model. It was, a, it was an optimizer generator plus a, a system that, that would implement the things that, would, that the thing could spit out. And so I would say that the, this is the way, if you want to build a modern, modern uh, query optimizer today, this is how you would do this. You would, you would define all these rules in a higher level language and then have this thing generated for you. So that way, again, you're not writing the, 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 the tricky code that's in like a Postgres today. So the two ways now to do this, what, what the optimizer is going to spit out, uh, the, the, so the overall theme or the, the, the approach to doing query optimization is either we do a stratified search, the heuristics plus the cost-based search we saw in system R, and typically done with a, with a, a, a bottoms-up approach, or a unified search like in Cascades where I'm going to holistically look at the entire query plan, do all my transformations in sort of one, one fell swoop in one, one stage, and not worry about sort of rule-based approaches and, and cost-based approaches, have everything be, be all running together. So stratify search is what we've already talked about. Again, the idea is we, we, we have a bunch of rules that we fire off in the beginning that don't require a cost model to convert a logical plan into additional, another logical plan, right? And then now in our, in our DSL, we can define what transformations are allowed for given what cases, and we can define what the physical properties that need to be guaranteed from one operator to the next, and our rules engine can, can enforce this for us. You do, the, so you do all these heuristic-based stuff before, basically the same thing we did in System R, but now instead of writing C code, again, you write it in their DSL, then you do the, the cost-based search to map the logical operators to the physical operators. So as, I said, so as I said, Starburst was the, was the first version that, that did this at IBM. I'm not aware of anything that, that uh, predates this. Um, and so they would, they would represent the rules in this higher level language that would then convert the, the logical plan into something that looked like relational algebra, or sorry, relational calculus. And then they do other transformations on the relational cal calculus uh, you know, query plan. Then they would convert the relational calculus into the, the physical operators that then the system can then execute. So this is the approach that's used in the latest version of DB2 because my understanding is they, they I, don't, I don't know what portion of the Starburst they kept or threw away, but they, they, they brought the query optimizer over into, um, in, in, into DB2. There's a great blog article I'll post on, on, on Piazza from James Hamilton because he works at IBM and IBM was struggling to get DB2 to, to run well. And like they were, they, was a, it was a big blemish on, on IBM that they had a real crappy database system. And they, they brought over the, the Starburst team to make the new version of, of DB2 work better. I think it was the, the initial like Windows or Unix version of DB2 was based heavily on Starburst. And they, and they brought over the query optimizer as a big part of it. So the... Great thing about uh, Starburst is that it works well in practice because again, it's static rules for simple things. You can come up with pretty good query plan very quickly. Um, the, the downside is going to be is that the writing these things are going to be hard because it's going to be you have to reason about rational calculus. I don't even teach really rational calculus anymore because nobody ever needs it unless you go build something like this. Uh, so if CMU is generating a lot of database students and they don't know relational calculus. And what hope does the world have? Um, I don't know whether the, the if, I don't know I don't know whether it's still heavily based on this, but I suspect it is. Um, so the other big challenge is going to be is that the there's no way to set prioritization on transformations as far as I, if I remember correctly, like because the, you, you do the heuristics first, then you do the cost based uh, transformations. You there may be the case you want to do certain cost based transformations <laughs> first. Because right, there's a higher priority, and you'll get a better query plan out of them. But at least my understanding with this, because they have separate stages, they couldn't, they couldn't support that. All right, the last one will be the unified search. 
And again, this will be Volcano now, and then we'll segue into Cascades next class. The idea here is that we don't want to have separate stages. We don't want to do logical to logical first, and then logical to physical. We want to do everything all at once. And then we, now it's easy for us to specify, here's the, uh, here's the priority as we apply these transformations to, to guide us to the, 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 the optimal query plan, or what we think is the optimal query plan, more quickly than, again, having separate stages. The downside is going to be, because we're going top down, that we may end up repeating certain transformations over and over again at the lower portions in the tree. So to avoid having to recompute uh, redundant information, we're going to make heavy use of memorization to retain any estimations we've done for lower portions of the tree as we do transformations, so that if we do another transformation that, that we've seen before, we don't have to go through the process of costing it again. We know, we know what comes below it, because we, we've done it before. So Volcano is the, the sort of first real system that, that does this. Cascades is what came afterwards. Again, Microsoft SQL Server is based on Cascades because they hired him, they hired Gertz Graffy to go, if they, he wrote this paper, they hired, hired him to go rebuild their Craptimizer to use Cascades, and that's why they famously use it. So I say academic prototypes here, at least for Volcano. I think CalSite lists that they're using Volcano, but for, for us, I can tell they're, they're actually using Cascades. Um, you know, they're, they're doing the top-down rules engine approach but, and with memorization. All right, so here's what it looks like doing top-down. So again, you start with what you want the, you want the result to be. So I want to join artists, <coughs> up here as an album, and I want it to be ordered by the artist ID. And then now I'm going to have this rules engine that's going to, going to get fired for different patterns I have in my logical operators to then convert them into additional logical operators or into, into physical operators to execute. So I would expand this down, say here's all the, here's all the joins I could possibly do. Again, I'm uh, truncating this. Uh, no, that's all. Sorry. Um, and then I'm going to have rules again from logical, 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 physical. So a logical, logical would be join A and B. I can convert that to be join B on A. Logical to physical would be I join A and B, and I convert that to a hash join on A and B. Right? So you only go from logical to physical or logical to logical. It doesn't make sense to go from physical back to logical. So you don't do that. All right. So then I'm going to start at the top, uh, and then it, look at what, what's the next physical operator I would need, the next stage, to get me to the next logical operator below. So I could transform, uh, say album and appears, I could transform that into a merge join, come down here, f see how, got, uh, you know, how I got there, traverse down further, do another transformation to convert the, you know, this join into a, to a physical operator, come down and get a cost, get the cost for all the, doing the scans below, which I'm not showing, Come down here, do the same thing for this guy, get the calls for these scans below me. And then now I can then figure out what the best what the sort of the best path I've seen so far. And I do a branch of bound. If I find a path that is more expensive than something I've seen before, I can throw it away. Or now if I also embed the physical properties in my query plan and I see that I'm violating that physical property as I go down, then I can stop there because I don't need to see anything below that. So if I've come back at the top here, if I know that I need my node here, needs, the data needs, needs to be ordered on artist ID, then this hash join, I don't even need to consider anything below it because I know it's not going to produce any, any data that's sorted for me. But I could have a quick sort, you know, a, an order by clause here, and that's fine. I, I'm allowed to traverse down there. But if now if I say, well, what's the cost of everything below me in the tree? I know what my upper bound could be, and that's more expensive than anything I've seen before, then I can just you know, truncate the tree here and not, not go down any further. So again, this is a quick, quick overview of what sort of the difference is. We'll go in more detail next class when we talk about Cascades. But this is a high-level idea of what, 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 they're, what they're doing. But we'll see how we do these, these, these transformations, how we maintain the memo table, how we do expansions. We'll cover that next class. All right, so the Volcano Officer. I so I, I like Cascades a lot. The Germans use uh, the Starburst approach. <laughs> he complains to me, whatever. Because we, when we were building our data, we said we were using Cascades. Um, again, from a pure algorithmic standpoint, the, the search algorithms for doing the top-down approach that we'll see next class, sorry, the bottoms-up approach, the, strat, the stratify search, algorithmically, those perform better than Cascades. 
uh, but not every system does this. And from a software engineering perspective, I like the idea of having all the rules defined in one location and one single engine to take care of everything. But that, that's more, more of a personal preference rather than uh, anything backed by, um, you know, by, by the science. All right, so we'll, again, we'll cover all this in detail, more, more detail next class. But again, the, the big thing to understand going to is would be this, this top-down versus bottoms-up approach. We'll, we'll, we'll debate that more uh, on Wednesday. All right, so the main takeaway I want you to get from this talk is that query optimization is hard. Um, this is why all the NoSQL systems at first didn't do any query optimization. Because they're like, oh, you don't need SQL. SQL is slow. Well, it's slow if you have a bad query optimizer. So they, they just sort of, oh, we, we won't do query optimization. Um, eventually, they've all realized that's a mistake, and they have to go back and add it. MongoDB did something that seems kind of stupid, but actually it's kind of clever when you think about it. They didn't have a query optimizer. What they would do is generate all possible query plans, run them all, see what everyone comes back first, and that's the one they would pick. <laughs> right? That does this. Like, it's like they, just run. they run them all and see what everyone's fastest. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, and then, and then you basically have a threshold. Like, okay, well, after like 20 times, then I'll, I'll run them all again and see what comes back first. Right? And I think, as far as I know, last I checked, Mongo still does not have a cost based query optimizer. Um, so, we've had a lot of speakers come in the last three or four years uh, to CMU, mostly you know, over Zoom to come talk about their core optimizers, because it's the part of the system, again, I, I know the least about. I find the most interesting. So today I made actually our YouTube playlist. Here, here's all the talks from, from previous years that have, from companies talk about the core optimizer. The one I can recommend more than anything else, I'm, I, I was actually debating whether to assign you guys to watch this video instead of reading the paper on Cascades, is the one from, about Cascades from Microsoft. Um, yeah, watch this. Don't read the, don't read the paper. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm serious. No, so, and, and the paper I'm having you guys read or, that I was assigned, it's, it's, but it's not even the original Cascades paper. The Cascade, original Cascades paper is terrible, right? Because uh, it it's like, it, it's from the 90s, so it's talking about how object-oriented it is, and like, oh, crap like that, it doesn't matter. Like you, like, you cannot take the original Cascades paper and actually implement it, right? But you can watch this talk. Uh, it, yeah, this talk does a better job. Like, the, the paper I had you guys read is a master's thesis not even from Gertz, from guy, somebody at, at, at uh, like Portland State. And, I, and, and it's only like 30 pages that I, that I assigned you guys to read in the master's thesis, because that describes what Cascades actually does. There's a bunch of stuff at the end, how to optimize it. We don't care about that. Yeah, just watch this video. That's better. It's better. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll update it on Piazza. Uh, and, but still write the review for this. Um, write the review for the video. For the video. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. All right, so... so Nico worked in SQL Server there for a long time on the optimizer. Like for the longest time, you know, the researcher would say Cascade or SQL Server has the best optimizer, but nobody knows how it's actually implemented. This thing describes it, and there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of cool stuff in it. Um, anyway, and then the other guy talking, Cesar, his son went to CMU, but his son didn't work on query optimizers. Okay, all right. So again, this is a crash course on how to build a query optimizer. We'll go in more detail about again top down versus bottoms up uh, next class. Uh, and I'll try to talk a little bit about adaptive query optimization because I think that's super useful. We used to have another lecture about it, but we, in the sake of time, we're, we're, we, we skipped it. Um, and then I'll, t I'll spend more time, I'll, also time talking about like, here's what actually real systems actually do. But you'll see what SQL Server does, but I'll cover like Databricks, MemSQL, CalSite, and, and others. Okay? All right, guys. Enjoy the weather. See ya. <laughs> that's my favorite all <laughs> What is it? Yes! It's the SD Cricket ID. I make a mess unless I can do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, Duke. I play the game where there's no rules. The homies on the cut say I'm a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a boy. Six pack 48 gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Isaac's straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>